Sure, the, uh, the Equality Effect is a human rights organization made up primarily of lawyers, uh, but it's interdisciplinary in its makeup. And we use human rights law to hold perpetrators accountable for their sexual violence, uh, looking to bring an end to the impunity for rape, uh, focused primarily on child rape at the present. And we do that by suing states for their failure oh. to protect girls and women from sexual violence. How, how long have you been doing this? Uh, it is 21, uh, 11 years. 11 years. What, how did you, what was it that there had to have been some inciting incident that you said, ah, I, I've got to do this? What, tell us about there is, that. There is definitely a, um, a point of origin. I mean, I'd been doing human rights law forever since, uh, since the early days. For me, being uh, uh, one of the last thalidomide survivors born in Canada, it, um, the idea of human rights and impunity really uh, is very personal. But in terms of the issue of impunity for sexual violence, a friend of mine in Kenya approached the equality effect. She is um, she's a bit of the Erin Brockovich of Kenya. She's not a, uh, not a lawyer herself. She's a social worker. Her name is Mercy Chitty, and she runs an orphanage and shelter for victims of rape. And she said to me, I have 160 girls, all ages three to 17 years old, survivors of rape, and they need access to justice. They, uh, they've they been raped and they are not getting any kind, of, uh, any kind of justice, despite the fact that excellent laws exist in Kenya to protect girls from rape. So as she explained it to me, she, um, she wanted to stop rescuing the girls from rape and uh, wanted to stop mopping the floor and wanted to turn off the tap. And that's what we do at the Equality Effect. We look for, um, for systemic solutions to inequality. This is the first time I had heard that part that there were 160 girls because what's the name of the organization that's umbrella over this particular project? So we are the Equality Effect and we're the umbrella facilitators and we, um, we link the partners in the project. So. There are, uh, to start, it was just the rape rescue shelter and the equality effect. And now, surprisingly, having, um, having been successful in the litigation against the state of Kenya, we're now partnered with the police as a, um, as a surprise turnaround that we did not anticipate when we, uh, when we started out as adversaries. And I think as the police describe it, um, they, uh, they, recognized the, uh, the litigation, which they lost um, in a pretty significant way. They recognized it as a wake up call. And, um, and I think that has made all the difference is having that, that leadership from the top down in terms of creating the change that we're seeing now on the ground, like our, our rape crisis partners describe it as a night and day difference. The, uh, the, the, um, the change in terms of the police treatment of rape or defilement is the legal term that's used in Kenya before 160 girls and after 160 girls. Give us an example of, of what you're measuring. I guess it's number of rapes and, and the number of rapes has gone down or is the number of prosecutions have gone up? What's, what's the measurement? So really, really tricky as it always is to, um, to get a handle on, uh, on, the, uh, on the measurement of the, the actual rapes. So, um, so we are doing that work in an innovative, uh, in an innovative um, initiative, working with, uh, with, with measurement experts. We are um, we're working with the schools to, uh, to assess the, uh, the level of rape, the uh, rape incidents pre-160 girls, which means pre-police uh, training and, uh, and engagement with the schools through our justice clubs and during and after. And what's unique is that we have, for the first time um, ever in, in Kenya, and as far as we know, in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, been given permission through the Ethics Review Board to work directly with the students, with the children, to, um, to collect this information because studies have been done in the past to assess the, uh, the rape incidents um, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, UNICEF studies, uh, Government of Kenya studies. But they've always had to have the uh, the authorization of the parents to participate in these uh, in these studies, and that creates a huge conflict of interest because we know, as is the experience for women and girls around the world, 
primary perpetrators are people in the home, are the, mm -hmm. the extended the parents, the fathers, the stepfathers, uncles, extended families. So, um, so the fact that we have been able to successfully arrange for direct access to the kids is already um, proving really insightful for us. When I, we first met and I went to the website and started to educate myself, I was pretty shocked to read one in three Kenyan girls experience sexual violence. How, how is that a thing? So that uh, I, we think based on our research so far is, a, is likely an underestimate of the, uh, of the reality. And you know, when we started this work, our youngest victim, and I call her a victim, I know survivor is, um, is a, a term that's used as well, but this little girl died. So I don't think mm. we call her a survivor. She was three years old and, oh, uh, and we have survivors and victims who, uh, who are three months old. Our most recent was one day old. What? And it, it, is, a, um, it is a situation that is extreme and urgent in its nature in terms of needing a um, demanding a, uh, a solution. And, and I think the core, the core of the problem really is the past impunity for, uh, for child rape. Why, and why is that? It feels like rape has, you know, is one of those, I don't know if it's in the 10 commandments, but it's been a, it's been a law. It's been at least a, a social moray for thousands of years, I would expect. What, why is it not the case in Kenya? So I, I would say that Kenya is not at all alone in this, uh, in this experience, although there are extreme um, uh, situations happening there as there are in other, uh, in other contexts. But this lack of impunity, I think, really goes to the heart of it. And you see the same thing on university campuses around the world, and we have it here in Canada and in the US where there is a, um, a lack of, um, of accountability in terms of uh, perpetrators being held responsible for their violence. And it creates this culture of rape. And, uh, and I think that now that we are starting to see increased accountability, the, um, the culture is changing in, uh, in Kenya. And so we, we look forward to proving the, uh, the concept we've piloted uh, in four counties, four out of 47 counties in Kenya, and seeing significant change. And we're looking forward to, uh, to scaling up throughout all Kenya, coming up in the next couple of years, and then transferring this model to other countries and to other contexts like university campuses where, um, you know, if you've read John Krakauer's book, uh, um, Zola, Story of a Rape, uh, it, um, you know, th those kinds of works, I think, really capture the, um, the international nature of this, uh, of this epidemic. So you, you hear about this, you decide to do something, you rally people, not just other lawyers, but on the on your site, artists, musicians, filmmakers, journalists, teachers, students, judges, parliamentarians, and you, you come up with a plan. And there's 47 counties. Are they called counties or provinces? Counties? Counties, yes. Counties. And you've, you've been effective in four of them. But now I'm, I'm, you said this isn't just Kenya. So I'm thinking how, how widespread is it all of Africa? Is it Southern Africa? Is it... So it really is international. I mean, we've been invited uh -huh. uh, to partner around the world, um, you uh -huh. know, across, uh, across Africa, in, uh, in the Middle East, in Central America, the indigenous communities in, um, in the US and Canada wow. have a real interest in this wow. in terms of failure of police to uh, effectively protect women and girls in those communities. So, um, so there is a real, uh, I think, opportunity in terms of um, in terms of creating change. There's there's no shortage of business. Yeah, un unfortunately. So, so you you figure out that the way to do this is through litigation, and and so how did that first one go? I'm, I'm imagining you know you go in. Well, we're we're suing the state, like. Well, you can't see the state. Uh, what? So it it it, uh, it definitely took a lot of um, a lot of brainstorming, and it was two years in the developmental stages and figuring out w w what would be the best legal strategy. And so we initiated a constitutional claim. So this isn't um, individual lawyers representing individual rape survivors or or victims. 
it, um, it was a constitutional claim and it was risky because if we lost it, um, it would jeopardize equality law in Kenya and beyond, but, um, but we won and it was a brand new constitution. And so it was an excellent precedent that was set in Kenya, getting justice for all 10 million girls in Kenya through one claim. But it also set the high watermark for girls' rights internationally. So we were able to establish <clears throat> not just that the police treatment of the girls' claims was unconstitutional, and it was a whole spectrum of evidence that, um, that was collected over a period of two years, at great risk, I should say, to the, um, to the social workers whose lives were on the front line collecting this evidence for us with our support uh, in the background. But the lawyers were definitely in the background at that point. And, uh, and then we, we litigated and any lawyer will tell you it's all about the evidence. And we had it, what makes lawyers really sound perverse. I think sometimes it was great evidence and it was tragic, tragic stories of little girls being, um, being violently raped, dragged from their homes, raped by three men in a, uh, in a field crawling, and this was uh, Jessica crawling home and uh, and her father insisting with the police that they they uh, they investigate and arrest the perpetrators, and the police failing to act. And um, in fact, uh, because of Jessica's persistence, uh, the, the persistence of her father, in the end, asking him to uh, to investigate, handing him the uh, uh, the arrest warrant issue, which he took on. And he's blind. Her father is what? blind, but. Uh, so it was a um, it, there was a there was a lot of room for improvement in terms of the, the police treatment of rape in those early days, but um, that was the evidence we had to work with. The court found that um, that uh, the the treatment was unconstitutional in terms of police uh, police failure to uphold the uh, the laws that exist in Kenya, but then the court also accepted a pretty radical argument that we made that the police were actually responsible for the climate of of rape and the culture of rape through creating this um, culture of impunity for rape. And that's what really set the high watermark for girls' rights internationally and it still stands. And I think that um, that's really to the benefit of the Kenyan police. They saw that as the wake up call and, mm -hmm. um, and they have been on board since then. They didn't appeal the case. They didn't, um, there was no pushback. They, uh, they came to us and said, uh, can we partner? They said, you know, we, and to be fair, the, the judge, this wouldn't have been appropriate. The judge didn't set out how you conduct prompt, proper, effective and professional investigations. He just said, that's what you have to do. So the police came to us and said, can we do this together? And so we work peer to peer. We work with Canadian police from Vancouver and with the Kenyan police and human rights lawyers from around the world. And we've developed this police training that is child focused, that is survivor focused. So, um, so it is uh, unique. I think Dan O'Reilly at um, Duke University, the, the behavioral economist, has been really helpful to us in terms of ensuring the training is focused on, um, on the beneficiaries. And we work with the girls and we, we vet everything through the girls and they tell us, you know, what, uh, what is helpful, what's not helpful, both in terms of police training and uh, school engagement with the, uh, the kids on the front line. So, it is, um, as I mentioned, it's really interdisciplinary and it is quite layered and resource intensive, but it is unusual and different. And I think that's why it's having an impact. Other than this whole thing being shocking and surprising, what, what would surprise our listeners right now? You know, I think when I, um, when I went to a police station just before the pandemics, pandemic hit and, um, and I'd been at that police station about six months earlier, and they had not been interested in reform or in um, uh, learning new uh, and innovative ways to, to treat defilement cases. And so the chief of that station got sent on a, uh, on a training session with us. And six months later I arrived and really it was night and day. They would had uh, 10 child rapes reported in that six months. Eight of them had been investigated and had resulted in prosecutions. Two were still being investigated including a, um, an expat from, uh, from Norway who uh, had set himself up in a local community and established himself as a serial rapist in this community. So they had been doing a stellar job. And when I said to the, um, to the, the OCS, the officer in command of station, I said, so, so what happened? Like, why the difference? 
because this is a stark difference. And he said, I know. He said, the last time you were here, I did not give you a warm welcome. And I was like, that is an understatement. <laughs> like he barely looked up from the newspaper he'd been reading, didn't turn off the TV. And he said, he said, I went on that train. He said, I didn't want to go. I said, I know you were a day late. He said, I was a day late. I know. He said, I didn't want to go. And he said, I went. And he said, that training, he said it, it made all the difference to me. He said, before that training, I was an old style cop and I didn't take child rape seriously. And he said, now I'm a born again police officer and I treat every child rape as though that little girl is my little girl. And I am, I am so appreciative that your group is working and is working so hard and i'm going to guess you're working with a lot of other groups and i just on on behalf of all of us uh, that are listening I, I just want to thank you because the i love the work that you're doing well thank you mark it uh, it really is a um it really is a huge team effort and uh and have the opportunity to uh, to engage like this and to, to share these stories and to, um, to, I think it makes a huge difference to the police and all our team members to know that there is an international audience that supports this work. It really is, um, it energizes.